And now to our top headlines. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo condemned Iran on Saturday for carrying out missile testing. Depco file reveals the missile tested was a Khorram Shar medium-range ballistic missile, which he said could strike anywhere in the Middle East and even parts of Europe. This multi-headed missile had been test-launched the day before on November 30th from a site in southeastern Iran and struck all its preset targets. The weapon is an advanced version of Khorram Shar ballistic missile with a range of around 12,000 kilometers and can carry multiple conventional or nuclear warheads. Iran was known to be working on a ballistic missile capable of carrying nuclear warheads. The Khorram Shar missile was first developed by Iran from the North Korean Hawasong 10 medium range ballistic missile and was tested over two years ago and shown in a military parade in Tehran in September 2017. The test on Friday of its most advanced version was intended as a warning to the U.S. and Israel should the Islamic Republic or its proxies suffer attack. In his condemnation, Pompeo called on Iran to halt these tests since the development of this ballistic missile was in violation of UN Security Council Resolution 2231. However, the Iranian Foreign Ministry has replied that the missile program is defensive in nature. The testing of a ballistic missile carrying multiple warheads introduces a new and ramped up strategic dimension to the tensions between the U.S., Israel, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Iran. The testing happened the day after Israel was reported to have conducted a massive surface missile attack on Iranian and pro-Iranian military facilities in Syria. In light of these developments, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has made his way to Brussels to hold an urgent consultation with U.S. Secretary of State on Iran's latest missile test. He is accompanied by the Mossad chief and national security advisor. The IDF targeted Iranian Hezbollah and Syrian targets on November 29th in its largest ever surface missile attack on Syria, lasting 75 minutes. According to Debka Files intelligence and military sources, this was not a regular Israeli Air Force strike as two kinds of ground-to-ground -ground missiles were used in this cross-border offensive. A long-range artillery weapon system known as LORA, which has a range of 400 kilometers, and the guided short-range Tammuz. According to Debka, surface missiles were used for the assault rather than the Israel Air Force, apparently to avoid stepping on Russian toes. The attack hit at least 15 sites, most of them belonging to the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps, as well as pro-Iranian militias and Hezbollah, covering an area ranging from the Syrian Khelmon slopes in the north down to the Iranian command center at Izra, north of Dara in the south. Among the locations targeted was Al-Zabadani, a town on the Damascus-Beirut highway near the Lebanese border, which Hezbollah had taken over and established its command posts, training camps, and ammunition and rocket depots. At Al-Kiswa, south of Damascus, the IDF missiles struck Iran's central command post in Syria, known as the Glass House. The command posts and structures of two Syrian brigades composed of Syrian officers, Hezbollah, pro-Iranian Shiite, and Palestinian militias were also attacked, as was the Syrian Army's 90th Brigade, which rules the area north of Kinetra, and the 112th Brigade, which is stationed in the south in the Golan. The massive Israeli assault has inflicted heavy casualties on the Iranians, their militias, Hezbollah, and the Syrian Army, including fatalities. A new wave of Iranian air freight traffic to Beirut International Airport has set off alarm bells at the U.S. CENTCOM Air Base in Qatar and at Israeli military staff headquarters in Tel Aviv. Debka's military and intelligence sources reveal that both are short on information for the reason for the accelerated Iranian air transport traffic and the nature of their cargoes. The CIA and Israeli intelligence services have, however, uncovered four major clandestine Iranian missile production projects in the works, beyond the dozens of small workshops scattered across Lebanon, known to be adding precision guidance components to Hezbollah's arsenal of surface missiles. Very little is known about the four large projects going up, two in Lebanon and two in Syria, though it seems Tehran is in a hurry to complete them. Debka reports that construction of these facilities is in the hands of the Qatam al-Anbiya Construction, an engineering firm owned by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. The two facilities in Syria are going up near the western town of Masyaf, which is covered by the Russians' S-400 air defense system. Debka's military sources have revealed the three of the four factories are completed and standing empty. The fourth stands out as different 
Sunk under the mountains near Banyas in northern Syria, the facility is assuming the shape of a subterranean military industrial city built along the same lines as the Fordo underground facility in central Iran. Since work is being carried out below ground, it is hard to determine the stage of the project, but when finished, this underground Iranian facility will present Israel and the U.S. with a new and dangerous challenge. First, due to its proximity of about 300 kilometers to Haifa, and second, due to its formidable protection, not just from natural rock, but also from extra hardening gained from North Korean bunker building expertise, all for extra protection against airstrikes and missile attacks. With us to discuss this is Dr. Mordechai Keidal, Barilan University professor and Arab Israeli affairs expert. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Our first three segments on the show have all been about Iran and Syria. So let's start with uh, the Qoram Shar missile tests. Why is this different from previous Iranian missile testing and why does it have the US and Israel so concerned? Well, first of all, as you know, uh, Iran is not allowed to test missiles especially ballistic missiles, according to the United Nations Security Council resolutions. And actually, Iran challenges the international community by even trying those, uh, those missiles. This is the first. Second thing, don't forget that Iran has already uh, hit targets in Syria by launching missiles from Iran. Means Iran's means business when it comes to missiles and targeting targets uh, in, you know, in states like Syria or maybe further when it comes to Israel. So this actually shows that the Iranians do not want to abide to the rules which the international community tries to force on them. And then this is how they challenge the whole international community. And this is why people are very worried about this. Mm -hmm. Netanyahu has pushed up a meeting with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to discuss the region. Can we expect any U.S. or Israeli retaliation for this missile testing? Well, it could be that they try to coordinate all kinds of actions between the United States and Israel. And maybe Israel or Netanyahu seeks an American consent to all kinds of actions which Israel, Israel might uh, perform in the, in the future. Uh, yet, uh, as you might know, I did not attend this meeting, and I really cannot tell you what was done. Mm -hmm. Now, the IDF launched a major strike on Iranian targets in Syria last week. It's the first strike since September. Should we expect to see more strikes given these new developments? It all depends on the Russian reaction. As long as the Russians do not say, say much about this, Israel can feel that it has an open door to act in, uh, in Syria when the gateman is only Russia, Putin <laughs> particularly. If Putin doesn't say something and his administration doesn't do anything against what Israel does in Syria, Israel can feel more, let's say, free to act in Syria according to the Israeli uh, demands of uh, security. Now, what about Russia's role in launching its air defense network across uh, Syria? It is directly helping Iran. Uh, what is the significance of this with regards uh, to, to future U.S. and Israeli action in Syria? No, no, don't, don't get mistaken. The Russians do not care much about the Iranians. The Russians care, care, first of all, about the Russians and maybe the Assad regime. As long as Israel doesn't attack Russian targets like Russian missiles or Russian, uh, Russian other kinds of facilities mm -hmm. or uh, uh, facilities which are connected directly to the Syrian regime, uh, uh, the Russians do not care much about what else Israel can target, especially if it's the Iranians. And I suspect that the Russians actually um, really do not object that Israel hits the Iranians in Syria because Putin knows very well that the uh, uh, Iranian role in Syria is destructive. This is why in my view, if he could get the Iranians out of Syria, he would have done it yesterday. But he doesn't want to get in trouble with them. He needs them to buy his products, especially a second uh, uh, nuclear electricity uh, facility, which, they, which the Russians try to sell to the Iranians. This is $15 billion. This is a big money. So Putin tries not to get the Iranians too angry about it. But uh, uh, I think that if Israel could kick out 
uh, Syria, uh, Iran from Syria, Putin would not object. Mm -hmm. Now, is there even a way for Israel at this stage to, to halt these Iranian advances? There is a way for Israel to make it slower by hitting time and again uh, uh, Iranian targets until the Iranians understand that the price which they pay for their uh, adventure in, in Syria is, is too high. Uh, and, and again, all, all also depends on the Russian consent, even silent consent, and the American backing for the Israeli actions in Syria. Mm -hmm. Now, Depka has now reported that uh, Iran is building a nearly impenetrable military facility under a mountain in northern Syria. Um, what is the significance of this? That they, they, they are there in order to stay there. That they, they, they don't consider themselves a temporary visitors in Syria, mm -hmm. but they see Syria as their front yard. Uh, they fought there against, uh, against, against ISIS and against others. And there is, since there is no free lunch, now they are coming to take what they think that they deserve to have, mean, namely bases, Iranian permanent bases on Syrian uh, soil. Uh, not, not only this, as you might know, the Iranians who are Shia uh, are kicking out Sunni populations from Syria. They, they will never let Sunni uh, uh, Muslims come back to Syria although they are Syrian citizens, in big numbers. They want to replace the population from Sunni to Shi'i. And they are actually bringing populations from Iraq, from Iran, from Afghanistan, all are Shia, in order to settle uh, in the houses, in the places which the Sunni Muslims lived beforehand, and they ran away. Uh, law number 10 of 2018, which the President Assad Assad issued actually gives them the ability because this law number 10 says that any Syrian citizen uh, has only one month, I think it started in May, uh, only one month to prove his ownership to his assets. Otherwise, the state confiscates everything. And now, since more than a month passed, six months uh, passed, many are not in Syria to prove their ownership, even the papers which can prove their ownership destroyed in the rebels of these uh, houses. So now the country can take, confiscate everything which uh, those people had. And now Syria can give it to whoever Syria wants, means to the Iranians and the Shi'i people who are flooding Syria today from Iraq, from Iran and Afghanistan. And this is actually what Iran wants to lose wants to do in Syria in order to prevent the next round of violence in Syria in 30 years from today. Because as you know, the civil war which was between 2011 and today mm -hmm. uh, was already the second round. The, f the first one was in the 70s until 1982. So since every generation sooner are uh, revolting against the regime, they want to prevent the next time in 30 years from today by replacing the Sunni population with a Shi'i one. And this is what Iran wants to do there. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for speaking with us, Dr. Mordechai Kedar. Pleasure. President Donald Trump has notified Arab rulers, but not Israel, that he is ready to discuss a timeline for the release of his Israeli-Palestinian peace plan. According to Depka, the rulers he called were Jordan's King Abdallah, King Mohammed of Morocco, President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi of Egypt, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, and United Arab Emirates Crown Prince Sheikh Mohammed bin Ziyad. The U.S. president told the Arab rulers that his plan of the century was finished and ready for immediate publication. He proposed that they set a date together and let a joint U.S.-Arab team make the final arrangements. He hoped to finalize all the details when he met the Saudi and UAE Crown Princes in Buenos Aires, on the sidelines of the G20 summit. Devka reports that Trump deliberately excluded Israel and Netanyahu from the process leading up to the publication of his plan for peace between the Israelis and Palestinians due to Netanyahu's unstable coalition and the prospect of early elections.
Publication of the long-awaited peace plan is now scheduled for late January or early February. The U.S. is forging ahead with a roadmap for securing its sphere of influence in northern, northeastern Syria by anchoring it on a new army and autonomous political system formed by local Kurdish factions. Amid recurring spats with Turkey and initial Turkish objections, Depco Weekly sources revealed that a deal was negotiated by, in Ankara by Ambassador James Jeffrey, Donald Trump's special advisor on Syria. That is designed to open the door for the U.S. to confirm its military and political domination of large sections of northern and eastern Syria, including the disputed Syrian-Iraqi border. This move will establish a real counterweight to Russia's military control of western Syria. The points of the deal struck with Ankara include Turkey's commitment to halt its army's advance into northeastern Syria, specifically the eastern bank of the river Euphrates and other Kurdish regions, a common threat repeated in President Tayyip Erdogan's rhetoric. What I said, the القوات التركية بمعنى إذا أطلقتم النار أو إذا قصفتم هذه المناطق قد يسقط جنود أمريكيون وبالتالي تتحملوا المسؤولية الأكراد هم الحلفاء الأساسيين على الأرض كانت مشكلة الولايات المتحدة منذ بداية الأزمة السورية عدم القدرة على إيجاد حليف على الأرض لذلك عندما استطاعت بعد معركة عين عرب كوباني أن تقيم مثل هذا التحالف فهي غير مستعدة للتخلي عنه the leading Kurdish party's political and military arms, the PYD and PYG, have pledged to purge elements of the Turkish separatist PKK, or Kurdish Workers' Party, from its rank under a U.S. guarantee. And the Kurds will also forgo their demand for the restoration of Afrin, the Syrian province seized by the Turkish army some 10 months ago. The deal will also see the formation of a new Syrian Kurdish army of 150,000 men under arms, around the U.S.-backed Syrian Democratic Forces Corps of 60,000 members, as well as the formation of a new autonomous Kurdish-Syrian government system in northern Syria. Finally, U.S. observation posts will define the borders of the new entity and monitor implementation of the deal with Turkey. The outposts have been a main point of contention between the U.S. and Turkey, though according to DEPCA, the first U.S. observation posts went up on the Syrian-Turkish border on November 24th. Three, at Tal Abiyad and two others at Ain al Arab, which U.S. sources said would protect the Kurds in case Ankara changes its mind and goes on the offensive. The U.S. is also reportedly seeking to open a line of communications between the Kurds and the Arab and Syrian opposition forces with a view to form a new autonomous political system in northern Syria. Depka sources note the fragile state of the deal with Ankara as to date neither Turkish or Kurdish officials have spoken publicly on the deal. Now for some more stories you may have missed this week. A nationwide women's strike that has received overwhelming support from Israeli institutions, including the Knesset, local municipalities, the Histadrut Labor Federation, Israeli universities, and women's organizations, is scheduled for Tuesday. The strike was called in the wake of last week's murder of two young girls, 13-year-old Silvana Tsegai and 16-year-old Yara Ayub. Their deaths bring the total number of women and girls murdered in Israel this past year to 24, marking a dramatic increase in domestic violence. The strike aims to shed light on this issue and calls for the government to implement a plan to reduce violence against women. Bethlehem lit a giant Christmas tree on Saturday and held a fireworks display outside the Church of Nativity to mark the beginning of the holiday season. Bethlehem is known as the birthplace of Jesus and holds an annual tree lighting ceremony, making it one of the city's most well-known celebrations of the year. With a height of over 50 feet and over 2,000 decorations and 500 cords of light, the tree attracts thousands of tourists and Christian pilgrims throughout the Christmas season.